All righty. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another ERI uh, New England chapter lecture series. Uh, my name is Isan Kiani Rod, and I'm currently serving as the president of the uh, New England chapter, and I'll be your host and moderator this afternoon. Uh, before we get started, I would like to use this opportunity to uh, invite you to get involved with the chapter. If you have a suggestion for a talk or workshop, or you would like to volunteer and help with other projects, uh, please reach out to me or one of the board members. We always welcome any suggestions or additional help. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, during the talk, if you have any questions, you can uh, submit them through uh, Q&A chat. But uh, towards the end of the lecture, we are going to open it up uh, for question and answer. And you can ask them if you have your uh, microphone on. Uh, please be advised that the presentation will be uh, recorded. And with that, let's get started. Um, according to some uh, estimates, the uh, impact of natural disaster events in uh, 2021 cost of the global economy uh, 280 billion US dollar, uh, of which approximately less than 50% were covered by um, insurance protection. Uh, catastrophe bonds and uh, related insurance linked securities uh, broke record in 2021 with uh, annual issuance reached uh, 14 billion US dollar for uh, property cat bond. And we thought it's a perfect timing to have a talk on this subject and some of the technicality related to design a cat bond. Uh, with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Katsuchiro uh, Goda is an assistant professor <laughs> and a Canada research chair in uh, multi-hazard risk assessment at the University of Western Ontario, Canada. Uh, his research is uh, focused on catastrophe earthquake uh, related uh, multi-hazard risk management uh, from economic and uh, uh, societal viewpoints. His research interests are broad and multidisciplinary and uh, cover a wide range of uh, academic fields, including engineering seismology, uh, earthquake uh, engineering, tsunami engineering, and uh, decision making under uncertainty. Uh, he has received multiple awards and recognitions, including the 2017 uh, Early Achievement Research Award given by the International Association for Structural Safety and Reliability. Uh, Dr. Goda, uh, thank you again for accepting our invitation. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming uh, to this uh, session. Uh, I'm very uh, excited, in fact, uh, to, to present this uh, work uh, because I do this research uh, kind of alone. And then this is, has been kind of a fun hobby uh, research uh, for me. So I don't have any um, pra uh, practical kind of experience in insurance industry, but the this kind of um, the topic which I'm going to introduce today, uh, catastrophe bomb trigger design. Uh, I really enjoy doing this. Uh, so it's been kind of eight, uh, eight, uh, eight nine years uh, since I started. Periodically, I do some sort of updates, like uh, when I have some uh, time to spend uh, for fun. Uh, so uh, again, I'm really happy to, to present. And hopefully uh, this topic uh, would be uh, interesting uh, for you. So um, the title uh, of uh, um, my presentation is uh, on the, the multi-hazard uh, catastrophe bond uh, trigger. And then we're gonna focus on the, the parametric one, which is based on the trigger of the cap bond. Uh, would be based on some sort of uh, hazard parameter, such as earthquake and, and location, 
or sometimes it could be intensity measures such as uh, if it's shaking, uh, strong ground motion, uh, spectral acceleration, peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, and if it's tsunami, it could be the, the wave height, and then potentially in future, uh, it could be inundation uh, depths, uh, potentially, which could be uh, obtained from satellite or something like that. So I'm just talking about the future things. But the um, what I'm going to talk about today is the uh, uh, first uh, multi-hazard shake uh, and then the tsunami risk modeling, uh, which I'm going to use uh, to set up the, the new medical model. And then uh, based on that uh, model output, uh, I'm going to uh, try to demonstrate uh, that the multi-hazard parametric uh, cap bond uh, trigger design can be uh, tackled. And then uh, by using the uh, intensity measure based uh, uh, approach, uh, this trigger design can be uh, enhanced. So that's uh, my uh, objective uh, for today. So uh, let me start with the uh, background and motivation. So um, this is the aerial photo uh, taken uh, one or two days after um, the 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And then by the way, I'm Japanese. And then uh, when this happened, uh, I was in the UK, in Bristol. Uh, and then, you know, I was a kind of rare species in, in the UK who is doing the earthquake engineering. Uh, at that time, and I was able to, to join some sort of field investigation team from the UK to Japan. And then by that time, I was just doing some, some uh, seismological kind of studies uh, from uh, PhD work and so on and so on. But the, when I saw this event and then the, after um, the consequences, um, I was very much shocked. And then um, uh, this kind of event uh, motivated, motivated me to, to do or turn myself uh, into uh, tsunami research. So since then, I started to do tsunami and an uh, earthquake. So as you can see, uh, this is the, the ocean coastal line is here, and then the tsunami came from the top side. And then you can see that the black kind of um, uh, inundated area. And in this uh, length, uh, the distance from the shore is about uh, three, four kilometers. So if magnitude of uh, nine event happens, then a huge um, uh, uh, inundation would happen. And then uh, those kind of uh, cities, communities would be washed away completely. So this is the, the southern part of uh, uh, Tohoku region, uh, so-called so Iwanuma region, uh, south of uh, Sendai. And then this um, caused uh, more than uh, 19,000 uh, deaths. And then also economic loss of uh, half trillion uh, only for uh, infrastructure, uh, houses, etc. And then as you remember, probably uh, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear uh, crisis also caused a significant loss. And it's still it's ongoing. And then it caused at least a half trillion, a half trillion dollars. So in total, uh, this event caused more than one trillion dollars loss. So on the ground, uh, this is my picture. Um, the, it would look like this. So um, you might, you know, uh, you are living in the U uh, US, uh, so you might uh, think about this kind of thing, uh, some somewhat similar to, you know, the, the tornado hit uh, recent um, um, uh, in the US, recent one. So it's essentially nothing left after uh, tsunami. And this is another uh, area of photo, uh, a bit northern uh, part uh, of uh, the Tohoku region of Japan. And then the same, essentially the same kind of pictures. There was a completely developed city. We only see some sort of big kind of uh, 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 infrastructure, such as big hospital, uh, shopping center, and so on, so on, the hotels. But the, most of the, the smaller uh, uh, houses uh, will be washed away completely. So um, before and after this event, uh, Japanese government has been uh, putting a lot of money uh, to, to, to make uh, more instrumented uh, in terms of seismic and tsunami. So before, after 1995, uh, Kobe earthquake, uh, the Japanese government put the cannon and kicknet, uh, which has uh, about 10 kilometer uh, spatial <laughs> coverage uh, across the entire Japan and also the kicknet. So that, uh, was a significant investment and that uh, helped uh, scientific community significantly, especially for the ground motion. 
And then after uh, this Tohoku earthquake, uh, Japanese uh, government put the, decided to put the uh, so-called SNET, uh, which is shown here. So that's a kind of 150 uh, stations of the offshore um, uh, ocean bottom uh, sensors. So now uh, finally it's uh, deployed, uh, completely deployed. And then uh, last week, I think, uh, the Tonga earthquake, uh, uh, so volcano happened. And then this estimate uh, successfully uh, measured um, the tsunami and issued an early warning uh, for the uh, Japanese coast. So uh, this SNET especially uh, uh, developed, uh, prepared for an uh, early warning system. But I thought that this kind of Canada kicknet and also the SNET can be also used for uh, parametric uh, catastrophe bond uh, trigger. So that's the, the focus of uh, today's presentation. Then uh, just to give uh, some very brief kind of uh, uh, primer uh, on uh, this uh, parametric cap bond. Um, the, the, um, the catastrophic earthquake and tsunami, uh, the, the loss can be very, very large and, and potentially exceeding the uh, lead insurance uh, um, uh, industry's capacity. So the financial uh, risk bearing capacity uh, can be of concern. And then potentially those kind of uh, additional uh, funds might need to be sourced uh, from financial market, which has much, much bigger uh, financial capacity. So that's uh, one motivation uh, in developing those uh, parametric cap bond. And then from insurer, uh, so investors point of view, uh, that is a preferable kind of uh, uh, products because uh, it's uh, relatively uncorrelated with the market uh, condition because that those uh, bond trigger uh, are purely based on um, the occurrence of natural disaster. And then from sponsors' point of view, um, so there's several uh, 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 advantages such that the, the funds are, can be available immediately. And then um, uh, that money uh, will uh, be able to use uh, uh, for uh, recovery and then the response uh, uh, operations. So, uh, and then I just want to clarify that the, what I mean by parametric. So the, the, there's uh, many different forms of um, the, the, the security, uh, how the security are triggered or the released. And then the, the what I'm focusing on here is the parametric uh, cap bonds, which means that the, um, the, the trigger of uh, uh, release of the fund are based on some sort of parameter, which are not based on the actual loss incurred by the sponsors. So um, that would cause uh, some uh, uh, advantage and disadvantage. The advantage would be uh, this basis risk. So this basis risk is usually uh, called as the, uh, the difference uh, between the actual loss incurred by the sponsor and then the, the payment received by the, the sponsor. So there's always some sort of mismatch. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the advantage of this cap bond uh, would be a highly uh, liquidable uh, kind of asset and also low default risk because the funds are already uh, uh, deposited uh, at some uh, other location. And then low moral hazard because once the rule for the triggering of uh, this bond is uh, agreed, then uh, there's not much, uh, uh, some bad behavior can happen. So there's a pros and cons. And in the context of uh, CAP model, uh, catastrophe modeling, um, the, there's uh, two types of risk uh, under this basis risk. One could be model risk, and then another uh, could be trigger risk. Um, my focus today is on the trigger risk, but also more important potentially, uh, or probably uh, aspect is the model risk, which is the discrepancy of the model and an actual. So of course, the, we, I mean, the catastrophe model uh, should uh, aim uh, uh, to achieve uh, the better model, uh, which would reduce the model risk, but I'm not gonna talk about the model risk uh, specifically, but rather focus on the trigger risk. And then uh, when it comes to this trigger risk, um, the, uh, the traditional cap bond, parametric cap bond, uh, especially for the earthquake, uh, based on a scenario-based approach or sometimes called as a cap in a box approach, which I'm gonna uh, explain later. The, the other uh, potential extension, the second generation of the parametric cap bond trigger could be designed based on the, uh, the intensity measure, such as uh, peak run acceleration at the recorded station, 
or um, the wave station at the offshore uh, wave recording station. So I call this second generation as station uh, intensity measure based IM, station IM based uh, approach. So I just define uh, the terminology uh, I am using. Given all those uh, background, um, the objective uh, for my talk is for us to develop uh, multi-hazard uh, cap bone trigger methods uh, for shaking and tsunami risk uh, by using a uh, second generation trigger method. And then uh, in uh, for, for Japanese uh, network system, uh, such as KNET, KICKNET, and then also SNET for tsunami. And then I would want to uh, compare uh, the diff uh, performance of the second generation uh, IM based uh, trigger method with respect to uh, cat in a box uh, first generation uh, trigger method, which is more simple, but the more universally applicable. So um, the second part of my talk is just to introduce the, the how I model um, uh, uh, shake risk and then also the tsunami risk. Um, so um, hope, um, yeah, well, I just, uh, because I use this output from this uh, uh, catastrophe model, uh, I should, uh, I saw that I should uh, explain uh, at least sufficiently uh, that some details about this modeling. So uh, the multi-hazard risk modeling I'm, I have implemented, uh, which simply follows the, the typical uh, uh, peer uh, 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 framework, uh, Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center's uh, framework, which is also, again, uh, based on the total probability theorem. So risk, of course, integration uh, is the integration of hazard times exposure times vulnerability. And then uh, in modeling this hazard part, I would define some stochastic rupture scenario, which is a typical um, approach uh, in CAP model, and then stochastic source model. And then uh, I define, I run the, the Monte Carlo earthquake tsunami simulation to evaluate the footprint uh, for each uh, rupture scenario. And then I combine that with uh, building exposure data and then uh, conventional fragility and then the damage assessment. And eventually I combine everything uh, to come up with the, the losses. So that's the kind of the approach I have taken. So uh, what I have said uh, can be uh, kind of visualized uh, in uh, this way, uh, in this, uh, as, in, as shown in this slide. So the first component is that the stochastic source model, it's a bit difficult to see, it's hidden here, yeah? but the whole bike uh, you can see. Yeah. Um, the, so uh, I'm gonna explain some brief kind of uh, uh, explanation uh, of uh, this method, but essentially I use the, um, the so-called scaling law Earthquake source scaling law, which uh, given the magnitude, I can define uh, through some sort of uh, prediction equation. Uh, I can define the length, width, and then also the slip, and then the slip uh, spatial distribution of the slip. So from this stochastic approach, I can generate a given magnitude, uh, the different shape of um, the geometry of the earthquake rupture, and then the different patterns of uh, the slip. And then for given, so I can generally say thousands of uh, those um, uh, different scenario for the different magnitude. Once I do that, then I can simply uh, perform uh, the ground motion simulation using the empirical uh, ground motion models. And also uh, for tsunami, I, I solve uh, nonlinear um, uh, uh, shallow water equation uh, in time and space uh, because the, the computational uh, cost uh, for tsunami is much, much uh, smaller uh, compared to ground shaking. And then uh, I can estimate this, for example, uh, intensity measure at the, uh, at the regional scale. And also I can uh, estimate the inundation uh, on land uh, at the building location. And then uh, I would need to have uh, some exposure data set. So uh, I can uh, go through available GIS data set and then uh, we can specify uh, the cost information, et cetera, for e e each individual building. Then by applying this uh, vulnerability model uh, for earthquake, shaking, and then the tsunami, 
um, we can estimate for each scenario, for example, magnitude 8.4 or magnitude 9.0, uh, I can uh, evaluate uh, the loss uh, to individual building and I can sum them up, right? And then I can generate this uh, scenario uh, uh, for given magnitude, uh, say uh, 500 models. Then I can obtain some sort of conditional loss distribution and then put uh, combine those uh, together uh, to obtain a final um, uh, exceedance loss curves. And uh, in the previous slide, I didn't explain um, earthquake occurrence model uh, because that is not directly related to uh, what I am um, uh, presenting today. But the, uh, in fact, in my model, uh, I do have uh, this earthquake occurrence model. So uh, in fact, the, I start with by correcting um, uh, the seismic catalog information. And then uh, we defi I define some sort of region and then uh, fit the Gutenberg-Richter relation. And then I discretize this Gutenberg-Richter relation uh, such that the, I have occurrence rate for the major events such as uh, magnitude greater than 7.5, uh, such as so this is the, the rate uh, based on the uh, Gutenberg Gutenberg Richter relation, and then conditional uh, uh, weights or the rates uh, for a given uh, magnitude range, such as 7.5 to 7.7, .7 and so on and so on. And then I can use these uh, weights to, to obtain um, uh, the occurrence model. Then, uh, as I mentioned, um, I use the uh, earthquake source scaling relation. So there's many earthquake scaling relations available in the literature. Um, I developed one uh, based on my uh, own uh, investigation uh, about five years ago or so, uh, by looking at the, um, the collection of uh, inversion model uh, from uh, historical events. So I looked into about uh, 300 source models or something like that. And then I developed a uh, uh, scaling relation uh, in a statistical way uh, uh, for um, the widths, uh, lengths, uh, average slip, maximum magnitude, uh, maximum slip, uh, spatial correlation factor, et cetera. So by using this scaling relationship, uh, I can randomly sample uh, those uh, source geometry parameter and then the slip distribution parameter. Once I have that, uh, then uh, those uh, geometry would change for each event. And then also I can randomly simulate um, the, the, the earthquake slip field based on the, um, the wave number uh, spectrum. So I show here um, the four different uh, variation of the cases uh, of uh, this earthquake slip uh, distribution. Uh, for the case of um, uh, amount of nine event uh, off uh, the Tohoku, Tohoku, Japan. So here's the Japan and then the, here's the Tohoku region. So uh, you can see that the, the geometry uh, would be different. Like some uh, uh, slip model uh, would have uh, longer uh, uh, strike lengths and then the down dip uh, widths and then the different concentration, different patterns of uh, the slip. And I can generate those uh, for uh, different uh, magnitude um, uh, range. So for this study, I uh, generated uh, 500 uh, heterogeneous slip distribution for um, uh, eight uh, different uh, magnitude range spanning from magnitude 7.5 to 9.1. So I, in, in total, I generated 4,000 uh, slip distribution like this. Then um, I can uh, uh, apply the, the ground motion model. Uh, for this, uh, I used the peak run of uh, velocity based uh, ground motion model for Japanese uh, earthquakes. And then I considered the spatial correlation model I developed uh, in the past. And then I applied the JSIS uh, site condition uh, uh, information. Uh, that's for the ground shaking. And then for the tsunami inundation, uh, I solve, uh, given the rupture, um, I solved the, the nonlinear shallow water equation in time and space. And then I run this simulation many times, which takes a long time. And then uh, I can evaluate it for each location, for each building location, uh, maximum inundation height, and also the uh, flow velocity. So this is just the um, uh, example of um, uh, 
uh, magnitude of 8.4 scenario. So if um, the earthquake happened to be a bit south of this uh, Tohoku region, uh, Sendai is here, and then Iwanuma, which I show the picture, is around here in the box. And then the zoomed version uh, of this shaking PGB distribution, and then the tsunami inundation uh, is shown. So um, the, the, at the magnitude 8.4, uh, PGB is relatively moderate, uh, 60, 70 centimeter per second. Uh, but on the other hand, tsunami inundation is uh, somewhat limited uh, along the coast. I can do the same uh, for magnitude 9.0 uh, scenario. So uh, we can see that the, the size of the earthquake has expanded significantly, and then the slip concentration is very significant. So uh, of course, the, the, with the larger magnitude, um, the, uh, the, the peak run acceleration, uh, peak run velocity, sorry, uh, increases. Uh, so yellow becomes red, but uh, you can see the drastic changes uh, in the uh, inundation extent uh, along the coast. So uh, we can consider uh, this effect. Um, exposure data set. Um, uh, for this example, uh, this study, I used the exposure data set uh, based on the Japanese government's uh, GIS data set. Um, and then uh, I focus on this uh, Iwanuma location, so which is shown here. So that's the south or just south of uh, Sendai, which is the, uh, the largest city uh, in this region. And then the, the region looks like uh, this uh, kind of, this is elevation data in Iwanuma. So it's kind of coastal uh, plain area. So this, it's a relatively flat uh, area. And then uh, I'm gonna focus on this um, uh, small uh, section of this community, uh, which is bounded by the two rivers uh, locally. And then uh, there are about 6,000 uh, houses uh, is in, in, in this range. Also, I'm gonna show one another case uh, as a numerical example, uh, when the, um, the building exposure data are spun over a little bit uh, uh, over the, the wider area. Uh, so for that purpose, I considered two additional city, um, the Onagawa and then the Shizugawa, which is in the rears, uh, more jagged uh, coastal uh, area uh, in the north of uh, Tohoku. So, uh, Onagawa is a bit northern uh, of uh, Iwanuma, and the farther north is the Sizugawa, which is here. So it's, it's a smaller area and it's bounded by the uh, mountains or hill. Uh, for vulnerability modeling, uh, I used the published um, the uh, uh, shake uh, fragility model uh, for Japanese building, uh, so which is based on the historical uh, 11 earthquake or so. Uh, so that's um, the fragility model I used. Uh, and this uh, fragility model uh, comes as a function of peak run of velocity. So that's another reason that I chose IM, uh, intensity measure, as a PGV. And then for tsunami, uh, um, we developed our own uh, tsunami uh, based on the damage data uh, from 2011 to Hoko earthquake. Uh, so we use our own uh, tsunami fragility model. Uh, 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 based on the, 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 the data. So once we have all the pieces, then uh, we can combine those uh, to obtain the final uh, uh, exceedance loss curve, uh, EP curve. So, um, so as I said, the, um, um, I first generated a 4,000 uh, source model and then the 500 model uh, for each. And then for each of the 500 model, given the magnitude, I can run the, the tsunami simulation on the shaking simulation and I calculate the losses. And I can develop uh, some uh, empirical uh, probability distribution. Right. And then by having this eight, I only show four here, uh, but the eight uh, conditional probability distribution for a different magnitude. And then by weighting those uh, based on the, um, the occurrence model, then uh, we can obtain, combine those conditional probability distribution into uh, uh, exceedance loss curves. So that's how I get uh, exceedance loss curve. So this is the, uh, the results uh, for, uh, in terms of exceedance uh, probability curve uh, for uh, Iwanuma and then a combined portfolio of Iwanuma, Onagawa, and Shizugawa. Um, so we can develop uh, the exceedance probability curve only for shaking only for tsunami, 
and then combine. Yeah. And then for the sake of uh, my presentation, I'm going to use uh, those uh, uh, fractal value, uh, uh, probable maximum loss at the um, uh, one in 200 years, one in 500 years, and then one in 1,000 years, just as the illustration to define the loss level. So um, I still have about 15 minutes or so, so I'm just going to uh, 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 jump into some of the, the results. So the multi-hazard cat, cat bond uh, trigger design uh, is the, again the main focus, and then uh, essentially this cat bond uh, trigger design is a, is to find a, the suitable uh, functional form uh, for this uh, multi-hazard loss uh, uh, value uh, as a function of uh, some uh, intensity measure, and then this intensity measure, which is the trigger variables, uh, can be aspect source variables or uh, shake and then the tsunami uh, hazard intensity values. And then if I use the, the earthquake source variables such as magnitude and location, then I call this as a cat in a box or the first generation. And then if I use the, the combination of those earthquake source model and then also the shake and the tsunami hazard IM value, then I call this as a second uh, generation uh, trigger method. And then my target uh, variable uh, to, to be predict uh, to predict uh, the the multi hazard losses uh, for buildings in Iwanuma, Onagawa, and or uh, Shizugawa. So depending on uh, the, which portfolio I am uh, looking at. And then I'm gonna test the both uh, first and the second generation trigger. And then the um, um, the trigger uh, mechanism uh, ba uh, based on the some uh, hazard variables. And then we try to uh, minimize the, the use of um, uh, hazard variables. So the smaller set uh, should be preferable because the, uh, it's the system, uh, trigger system uh, is uh, uh, less costly. But um, before I show some results, uh, it might be good to show uh, some uh, 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 exploratory uh, data analysis results. Um, so I can generate the shake loss for Iwanuma and then the tsunami loss for Iwanuma as a function of say earthquake magnitude. Yeah. And then the, the distance to the slip centroid, uh, so where the, the most slip, earthquake slip is concentrated. And then also I can uh, do uh, the similar scatter plot uh, for uh, peak and velocity in the middle of the, the building portfolio in Iwanuma. And also the, the right offshore, uh, there's a one um, uh, offshore wave station um, uh, of the Iwanuma. So I can uh, take this IM as an intensity measure. So as you can see that the, um, the, the magnitude is uh, some reasonable um, predictor of the losses, but the, the correlation is not that high, right? Because the scatter is high. And then the, uh, for tsunami, uh, we can see that the huge increase of the tsunami loss uh, when uh, it approaches, magnitude approaches uh, exceed, uh, say, 8.7 or so. So this nonlinear feature is important. And then uh, the scatter is uh, very large uh, when it comes to tsunami loss. Uh, the location information is not that helpful uh, when predicting uh, the tsunami or shake loss. Um, the, for the shake loss, uh, the ground motion parameter, uh, such as peak and velocity, is uh, useful, but still we see the scatter. But compared to magnitude, this is better uh, correlation. And then for tsunami, compared to magnitude, uh, we, we see uh, uh, some sort of trend. So uh, from this explanatory data analysis, uh, it's, it's already promising uh, that the PGV and then the, uh, the tsunami wave height, offshore tsunami wave height, uh, would um, uh, improve uh, this uh, prediction of the losses. So the first uh, method I applied is a scenario-based trigger. And in the scenario-based trigger typically works that the, uh, we define some sort of boxes uh, offshore the source region. And then, so we can change this uh, box size. And then given the box size is set, then uh, for each uh, box, uh, we can uh, plot the um, earthquake magnitude, which is the trigger variable, 
and then also the, uh, the loss we want to model. And then we draw some sort of uh, threshold or we identify the threshold uh, to minimize the, the maximize the accuracy, which is in the uh, diagonal. And then off diagonal is the, the error. And in setting this um, uh, threshold, uh, we might want to pay attention to the distribution of the positive error and then the negative error. So uh, we can optimize this threshold by also looking at the minimizing the total error, but also uh, making uh, more balanced uh, distribution uh, for the positive and the, uh, negative errors. And then once we def uh, repeat this uh, for each box, then uh, we might be able to kind of plot uh, the, the, the trigger magnitude as a kind of curve. And then we can do this uh, kind of uh, uh, optimization for the different loss trigger. And then also the different, uh, uh, the box size. So uh, I show three cases, three trigger level. And then uh, this is the 50 kilometer uh, uh, box size. So uh, this can be uh, considered as uh, the kind of the, the product, the trigger uh, mechanism uh, for uh, scenario-based uh, trigger vessel. So for this particular data set, which I created, um, the, the overall, the best performance I was able to, to do uh, is about nine to 12% uh, um, error. Uh, and then the error is simply defined as the total trigger error divided by the number of sample uh, I had, 4,000. So um, just to remember, uh, to, just to emphasize about nine to 12%, about 10% uh, error. Uh, can be achieved for this data set. Now I move on to the station uh, intensity based measure. So in station uh, IM based uh, trigger method, I use um, uh, mathematical approach as, um, uh, sorry, the logistic regression uh, method as a mathematical approach. And then uh, I, I fit the logic uh, function yeah, uh, using the generalized linear uh, model uh, approach. So uh, in this equation, uh, essentially this x1 to xk uh, can be the uh, explanatory variable, uh, which could be uh, PGB, uh, wave height at the offshore. And then we can add uh, those uh, variables as, as, as many as you wish. But for this demonstration, just to, to show illustration, I focus on the, the two uh, variables. So the one variable is taken as the, uh, the peak noise velocity at the one of the kickness station in Iwanuma, and then the right offshore uh, wave station uh, off uh, Iwanuma. Yeah. So we show, I showed the, the scatter uh, plot of this uh, loss versus uh, PGB, and then the loss versus uh, wave height. And then by fitting this uh, uh, um, data, uh, in uh, using this logistic regression, uh, we can obtain this kind of uh, 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 three-dimensional surface. And then we can select the, the, again um, the, the, the threshold such that the, uh, the minimize the total error, but also at the same time uh, minimize the, uh, the uh, making sure that the balance between the positive and negative error uh, are guaranteed. So we can do this a little fine tuning of um, the, uh, the optimization. Then uh, I can obtain this coefficient and then um, uh, we can use those calibrated model uh, for uh, uh, trigger design, uh, uh, bond uh, trigger. So station uh, IM based uh, trigger results uh, for the same data set uh, focusing on the Iwanuma location by just taking uh, using uh, PGB at the KNS station and then the, uh, the maximum wave height uh, right offshore uh, Iwanuma. And then for the different uh, trigger level. So this kind of three-dimensional uh, surface is very informative from my, at least from my point of view, uh, because uh, at the low uh, loss level, the, the both uh, wave height and then the peak run velocity uh, is influential, right? But the, as the, uh, the trigger level increases, then uh, the sensitivity uh, with respect to the peak kernel velocity becomes smaller and smaller. And then for the extreme uh, situation, such as thousand year uh, loss level, then, then the major driver uh, of the losses are coming from tsunami. So the PGB is not that sensitive. 
So uh, this kind of model fitting itself uh, is kind of uh, useful. Then uh, I can um, uh, uh, check um, the, how the, um, the trigger errors are distributed. So I can evaluate the, the, uh, the positive error and then the negative error, and I just simply add uh, to define the total error. And then for the different uh, loss level, uh, I can do this uh, optimization, right? And if, um, if we do um, the, 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 by just using the two uh, parameter, uh, what we can achieve is about six to 9%, six to 9% uh, error. So which is uh, already uh, smaller, uh, than uh, the, the uh, first generation uh, trigger method. But uh, I found that the, you know, if we look at the, the more details of the error, then um, the, the performance is not that great, uh, especially for the, the large uh, monetary event. So there's uh, uh, still a rooms uh, to, be, to be improved uh, to do better uh, for this extreme uh, situation. So that's one kind of um, uh, pending uh, issue, uh, which I, should be uh, uh, investigating uh, in the future. But, um, the, the logistic regression model is very flexible, in fact, uh, so that the, we can add uh, many different uh, uh, stations. And in fact, that there's many uh, candidate kickness station uh, for shaking, and also uh, 150 uh, offshore station uh, for uh, uh, tsunami. Uh, but also um, that we want to, to, to make this trigger system as robust as possible because sometimes the recording might not be made at, at those uh, locations. So I um, um, uh, incrementally added, uh, uh, what if uh, to the original case one, uh, just using the one seismic station and a one tsunami station uh, by adding additional information, how this error uh, would change. So those results are summarized uh, in this table. So the baseline is this, the first top line. And then by adding the different, uh, for example, magnitude uh, can be added or the location information can be added or additional seismic uh, station can be added or different um, uh, offshore station can be added. So in the end, I tested uh, many cases, but I'm just presenting case 10 as one of the, the uh, reasonable um, uh, uh, final kind of um, the trigger system uh, for this Iwanuma uh, situation. So uh, in summary, uh, my conclusion would be uh, by including additional three to four location, uh, the total trigger error ratio uh, can be reduced somewhat significantly. So 0 0.09 to 0 0.65. So 30% um, uh, reduction in uh, errors uh, can be achieved. And then compared to um, the, uh, 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 the scenario-based uh, approach, uh, this is about half or less than half of uh, inaccuracy uh, in error size. So, uh, which I believe, I think that the, the significant uh, improvement and which it should be because we are using the better information uh, in defining uh, those trigger functions. And then you might wonder um, uh, that this uh, previous example I showed is only focusing on the local station. So you, I only had, have to add um, uh, two or three uh, additional uh, station, right? But what if our focus is on the regional scale? So just to, to explore that aspect, I uh, uh, prepared uh, the different loss uh, data set um, and then the, uh, building uh, exposure data set uh, spans over three locations, uh, Iwanuma, uh, Onagawa, and Shizugawa, which come, uh, spans about 100 kilometers along the coast. So if that's the, the target, the loss, combined loss uh, in those three locations are the, the, the things to, put, to be predicted, then uh, how um, the, um, um, the, the carbon trigger uh, system should be designed. So by having just the one station, um, as you can expect that the, the, the uh, trigger loss is relatively large, but by having another uh, one seismic station and another uh, tsunami station near um, the uh, Unagawa and the Shizugawa, 
then by having additional uh, one station or two station, uh, we can achieve um, uh, relatively good um, the trigger error. So, um, so uh, the, my my conclusion would be uh, given the, the the target location, uh, we need to to select the suitable um, uh, 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 recording station uh, for the trigger design. But we don't have to add so many uh, location. We we could just add one seismic and one. At tsunami location uh, would be probably sufficient. Yeah. So um, I think uh, time is roughly up. So I um, uh, hope I didn't uh, make it too long. Um, so uh, the conclusion would be um, the I think that the uh, alternative risk transfer uh, uh, mechanism instrument uh, I think are useful. Uh, for disaster risk financing, and also uh, uh, offer more uh, efficient management of natural catastrophe. And then this study is presented um, the methodology for uh, the designing a multi-hazard parametric uh, cap bond trigger uh, for subduction earthquake and tsunami. And then the, the numerical example, I hope uh, clearly showed that the, with the better, uh, more advanced uh, observation system, if we, that system is available, uh, we can reduce the trigger error, but um, yes, uh, by say half or even less than half. And it just as a add, as a last kind of remark, a uh, future topic uh, could be um, this kind of IM method uh, can be uh, improved or extended by uh, taking the different types of um, uh, intensity measure or some sort of additional information. So the obvious kind of choice could be the remote sensing based uh, intensity measure. So that can be done for uh, shaking satellite image and also the inundation area uh, can be uh, obtained uh, from uh, the, uh, those kind of uh, satellite images. And then uh, that has been proven uh, to be very effective uh, in reducing the tsunami uh, loss uh, prediction errors. And then um, I use only um, the standard uh, statistical methods such as the, uh, the logistic regression analysis, but obviously we can uh, apply uh, machine learning methods such as the random forest method. So my, one of my students is uh, pre, uh, uh, exploring uh, if uh, we apply more advanced method, uh, then how much improvement uh, can we make uh, in predicting uh, those multi-hazard losses. So that's obviously um, another uh, thing. And then I hope that the, this, uh, you know, the case study I presented is only for Japan and you, you might think uh, that that's not that relevant, but the, um, uh, this SNS station uh, is very ideal, I think, uh, in exploring many different things because first, um, the, the actual observation is uh, available for free, right? So that's one good thing. And then another important thing is that the, the SNS uh, have 150 stations. So what if like we can uh, 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 develop more smaller system, then uh, within this uh, framework, uh, we can explore that the, is the two station system robust, three station system robust. So such kind of uh, uh, investigation can be done uh, in a realistic context by using the SNET uh, station. So that's, I saw the uh, kind of interesting aspect uh, in the context of cap bond uh, modeling. Okay, so that's all I just wanted to say. And then uh, if you have any question, uh, uh, I would like to answer. And then thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goda, for the presentation and interesting uh, work uh, you have done to share it with us. Uh, so we have about uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, so if you have any question, uh, please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself, and you should be able to uh, ask the question. Uh, so uh, maybe let me uh, start with the first question. Uh, question uh, about the uh, uh, methodology, uh, Dr. Goda. Uh, so as you uh, presented, you showed that the uh, errors coming from the station intensity-based um, 
uh, triggering is uh, lower than the scenario-based method. Uh, but considering that for this particular analysis that you have to develop your catalog, you come up with and calculate the intensities and use that intensity to calculate the loss at the end. Was it surprising to you that basically right now your intensity measurements in terms of the inundation or PGV is already is a byproduct of your catalog development, but at the same time, much closer to the loss calculations. So naturally, they should be like a better predictor of loss and lower errors relative to a, a source development. Yes, exactly. You know, what uh, Ethan said is right. And then that, that was a kind of, uh, a much, from the beginning, motivation that, uh, you know, I knew that they, it's going to work or it should work. And then, and then I just essentially showed that that is the case. But the, mm -hmm. Um, well, the catch might be that the, well, if the, the model of the cap model itself becomes more sophisticated and can be bodied against actual losses, then that's the pathway to, to, to follow, right? And then in the future, uh, we can test um, the different intensity measure and then quantify those kind of improvements before we actually put the, the instrument. So I think that's the kind of a way to design engineering system because I was told by my uh, supervisor that the engineer should not solve scientific question, not a known answer, but like a uninvestigated question. So that's all my motivation, but I just had a fun time in doing those. Thank you. Any other question uh, from the audience? Uh, if not, uh, I have uh, another follow-up question. Uh, for the ground shaking intensity, uh, you selected PGV. Uh, we know like it's uh, very like a common to go with a spectral acceleration or PGA uh, for that matter. Uh, was there any particular reason you selected uh, PGV for this study? Uh, so as, as you can guess that the, you know, my selection is uh, in a sense backward. So the, yeah. the fragility model for Japanese uh, cases are yeah. mainly for the PGB. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to use the empirical one rather than the analytical one. So that was a kind of the already pre-made choice that I have to follow the PGB. Otherwise I can't do for Japanese case. But for North America, like a spectral acceleration uh, would be an obvious choice because the, the, you know, the shake map like USGS produced the 0.3 second, one second constantly. And then in that context, like a pager shake map, like those kind of things can also be used um, potentially uh, for bond triggering, I guess. And if audience is not going to ask any other question, then I'm going to ask uh, another question. Uh, <laughs> So in uh, terms of the particular table that you showed for case one uh, through all uh, through uh, case number 10, you also uh, you also like tested uh, some scenarios that there is no uh, ground motion consideration in developing the uh, trigger uh, mechanism, uh, just relying on the like a buoy's uh, uh, wave height to uh, to predict uh, the, the, the losses. Uh, in terms of like practically, I was thinking that in a lot, uh, uh, particularly in like a developing countries, you may be able to find you know few uh, ground motion stations uh, on land, uh, but uh, maybe availability of uh, uh, buoys, uh, you know, data and uh, wave is going to be more difficult to obtain. Yeah. Uh, was wondering if you ever got the chance to also test what if for the same region, you, the only information you have is the ground motion station, but not anything about the possible wave height to examine how the model could uh, correctly or incorrectly uh, like a, estimate the loss. Yeah, I see. I see. Um, I haven't investigated it carefully, but like um, uh, to some extent, like as long as we have several, either just tsunami or either shaking. Um, it would improve um, the prediction because the, the, if the aspect energy release is large, then that would partially correlate it positively with either tsunami or shaking and so on, so on. So, 
some partial correlation will be already into account, taken into account in that context. So I would think that the, that also works, even for the, the multi-hazard loss could be predicted by using either type of uh, intensity measure. That's Intensive. possible. Got you. Uh, we have uh, one uh, question uh, also from audience, uh, Bing Ming. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask yeah. it uh, uh, yourself or I can like, read the question. Uh, so uh, please yeah. go ahead, Bing Ming. Hey, Sam. Thanks. It's a nice talk. Uh, I just have a quick question. You have the example is just considered a single Japan separation zone sources. Yeah. But yeah. there is, you know, all types of earthquakes in that area. If you consider these different types of sources, you have parameter, you know, trigger method, how the error will ch change. Well, I think that the, the, the trigger method would not significantly change unless I have two major source, which could affect the losses significantly. So you would have you have would have very different uh, types of sources. You have could have crustal, you could have uh, mm -hmm. deep in slab earthquake, you could have you know silent earthquakes, uh, you know, in, near the uh, trend axis, yep. and you have the typical sub zone earthquake. So they're they are very different in terms of ground motion prediction equations or the intensity uh, forecasting methods and all these type of things. So yes, so so in that context, I think that for the seismic, like uh, the uh, the intensity measure uh, based trigger should also work, uh, but we just have to have this uh, trigger, um, I mean, the source uh, implemented. And in fact, that I uh, explored that, uh, but not presented for this uh, paper, but the, uh, for Japanese case. So in slab crystal, um, and then the conclusion would be somewhat similar that the, the shake loss uh, become important when the moderate loss happen, but the extreme loss uh, for Japanese case uh, come from tsunami. Uh, so, yeah, so in that case, both tsunami and shaking is important, but the shake part, uh, different earthquake type can be uh, captured by using uh, the single uh, intensity measure. And uh, probably we have time for one last question. Uh, Navid, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, just a quick question for developing the EP curves that you showed. Mm -hmm. So as far as I could understand, you um, consider tsunami and earthquake um, separately. So you have one fragility set for a tsunami, one for earthquakes. But especially for the case you're considering, it's a near source tsunami. So then the damage of the two would be correlated. Have exactly. you looked at correlation? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. like a surface uh, fragility instead of just one intensity hazard? Yeah, so, well, I mean, of course I know your work. Uh, so, um, you know, um, the physical kind of correlation between the, the shaking damage cascading into the, uh, by the, cascaded by the, the tsunami damage, and obviously that needs to be done. So, I and mean, that is not uh, completely uh, considered. But in the context of the data I used, um, I used the Tohoku data. So in an implicit sense that the data I used already take that effect into account or it's embedded. But as you kind of did for your PhD, uh, you know, the performance-based earthquake uh, tsunami engineering approach uh, using the numerical model, et cetera, that's the great pathway uh, to improve uh, the model. So there's a huge room, I think, uh, for improvement. Thank you. And thanks uh, for all the papers you, you're doing. Uh, I keep uh, following your work. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Navid, for your question. Uh, so um, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, uh, Dr. You. Godo, for the uh, presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all uh, participants uh, for attending and for questions. I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Elizabeth Angel, Angel uh, for assisting in uh, uh, organizing and advertising this talk. Uh, everybody, uh, wish you a very nice day. Thank you.